Today we would like to honor Peter Sharp and the Good Lord. The Good Lord. That is what I heard Peter call Jesus Christ. After all, the chief end of man, or our main purpose, is to glorify God. God in his holy scriptures tells us how to live with our fellow man and also how to live with, or should I say, live for him. I would like to direct my message toward Peter and towards the good Lord. And I hope everything I say points in the direction of Peter and the good Lord. Looking back at Peter's life, I see three characteristics that sum up Peter to me. Comfort, celebration, and contentment. Comfort is the ability to come near and lend your strength to others. Second Corinthians, blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Peter, meaning rock, was a rock to many in his life. And in 1962, my parents moved us, Mark, Gary, and I, to Redlands, California, leaving Peter behind in Wisconsin. So at the age of about 24, he would have to make it on his own. He had joined the Army. He became one of the select few of those who made it through basic training and served our country. I have to believe that this training broadened his shoulders for the rest of his life. Not only did he take care of his family, he moved us back to Wisconsin after our father died. And he watched over my mom and Gary and I. He was like a father to Gary and I. And we, were, and we always knew that he was there for us no matter what. A cherished memory of mine will always be Peter walking me down the aisle at my wedding. And the special part that each Bonnie, Lisa, Kelly, and Heather played at my wedding. But most of all, Peter was a source of comfort to us throughout our lives. At a very little time in my life, many conversations would always end with Peter saying, keep your chin up. Gary and I, to Gary and I, that phrase, keep your chin up, is comforting, cheerful, hopeful, and it immediately brings Peter to mind. Celebration. Nehemiah 8.10. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food, sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This is a day holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. If I could try to sum up being included in Peter and Bonnie's holiday parties, I would have to say grand and delicious. You know what I mean by their hospitality, the way they always welcomed you and made every holiday a celebration of gifts, decorations, and always a most wonderful banquet of food. To this day, the memory of celebrating at their house is very special to John and I and our children. I know that Gary has many special memories of Pete. And he has a special memory of Pete taking him to Capitol Court for a giant banana split. <laughs> contentment. Contentment. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. First Timothy. First Thessalonians. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. I do not know if Pete had a bucket list, but I would say, I would have to say that what I saw was a content man who was blessed and satisfied with the everyday and the ordinary. When you are content with what you have, you have a heart of thankfulness. I experienced the most gracious thankfulness while helping on occasion at their house. 
Both Peter and Bonnie were beyond gracious and thankful for any small gesture on my part. I never wanted to leave them. It was my honor. It was my food to serve them. They were and are so thankful. If you have a bucket list, I encourage you to put the good Lord on the very top of this list. Love the Lord with all your heart. And ask him how you can serve him. And how can you serve others in your life? Fill the rest of your bucket list with serving and loving others. And I'll leave you with John 14, 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Keep your chin up. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, my daddy. I'm going to get through this. You are one of the most amazing people I've ever known. I was blessed by you in my life in so many ways. Thank you for adopting me. I was always just your daughter, just a regular daughter, always. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for raising me to be a thoughtful, caring, compassionate, giving, hardworking person. Thank you for always cheering me on and telling me that with hard work, I could be whatever I set my mind to do. You raised three strong women, and you were always the wind beneath our wings. So many years of great family times with you, Dale. A book would never have enough pages to capture all the memories. I am grateful I have these memories. Little did I know that I'm especially grateful today for those five days with you alone when you and I went to Mayo in November. Long car rides, many quick trip stops, scratchies, chocolate, and chicken fingers. An ultra-modern rental condo with no art, dashing you across the street in a borrowed wheelchair. A successful surgery, most importantly, in real time with you, Dad, just you and me. I knew that was special then, but now I will forever treasure those five days. When I think of you, so many things come to mind, Dad. A gentle giant, and the man who chose me to be his daughter. He got stuck with these two. <laughs> a circus peanut eater. A lover of scratch-offs. You were my partner in crime, and you trained me well. You were my referee when I was a teenager. When you picked me up from a neighbor's house when I ran away, two doors down, and you took me for ice cream. You loved the sub sandwiches from Kmart. <laughs> the special gifts only from you brought out in plastic bags after all the other gifts were open. A Valentine heart shaped candy box every year, every single year. You took us to the Shamrock Motel I mean, motel in Wisconsin, Dell is all in one room. You were a saint. When mom announced we were having a picnic or a party, which was often, you got to work, get the yard ready, and patio, you knew just what had to be done. You loved cold meatloaf sandwiches with ketchup. You were a man who was never afraid to tell us that you loved us, and you did all the time. You could never say goodbye on the phone. You were such a gentle spirit. You never cared if we filled the pool of shaving cream, ruined the grass, or messed things up. You were right there in the middle of it with us, and you could fix anything. 
You were a man of courage. You were strong enough to pull a nail out of my foot. Your girls had many visits to the yard, ER, which you were always there for. You were a proud Army veteran, Dad. You truly loved your girls to pieces, especially your favorite daughter, which changed depending upon which one you were talking to at the time, but I know the truth. <laughs> your famous shuffler walk. <clears throat> and the way you hum to yourself, that I will always remember. You love to play cards with the guys on Wednesdays. It was a highlight of your week. If you won a dollar or lost a dollar, it didn't matter. You never had bathroom time, raising three girls in one, breath, one bathroom. You were always cleaning the garage. I know now that's the only place that was quiet. You never missed one of our games, plays, debates, or high school dances. You enjoyed all the crazy dance parties, Dad, watching and smiling. Suspenders, yep. Sweater, yep. Heat on 80, yep. Always cold, yep. Every night you would thread your watch through your wedding ring in a nice, neat little bundle. God, I remember that so clearly. You always had a cough drop and powder creamer in your pocket. You risked life and limb every year, but you always put up the Santa on the roof. You gave me away at the altar, okay, a couple times. <laughs> And I'll never forget the train squirrels, one peanut under St. Francis's nose at a time. You're so brave, Dad. You underwent several huge surgeries, including being in a study at Mayo. You were a walking miracle. And you always handled the pain with grace and gratitude. Jim, your ICU, ICU angel is looking up to you now in heaven. No more pain, Dad. It's hard to sum up the wonderful 55 years I had with you. I wish I had a few more. I love you, Daddy. I'll see you someday. For now, I'll take care of the birds and squirrels for you. I'm Kelly. I'm the middle daughter. And I, I thought for my part I would share a few things that I learned from our dad. The first is family first. Dad loved our family very much and always put us first. One of the most telling stories about Dad was, and his character was that my dad was a plumber and he loved working new construction. On Saturdays, we would drive around and go see his jobs. We were so proud of our dad and his work. But in the 80s, when us kids were growing up and becoming more expensive every year, the recessionary times did not bode well for new construction. So our dad took his skills to Briggs and Stratton and took an extremely tough job working as a pipe fitter in a very hot foundry to provide for his family and to have more steady employment. This sacrifice for our family represents our dad. Never once did he complain about it or even mention it. Another thing I learned from dad is to always make people feel special. In the 70s and 80s, there were not that many extracurricular bonding opportunities for girls and their dads. But dad found something that was so special. He enrolled us in what was called Indian Guides and Indian Princesses. This was a dads and daughters organization where every month we did a project, we had a snack, but mostly we spent time with dad. This also included an awesome dad and daughter camping trip every summer. That our dad would find this and do this with us was precious and very special to us. Our dad's Indian name was Skyhawk, Heather was Silver Feather, I was Golden Sunset, and we were proud members of the Creek tribe. Those of you who know my dad and his love for birds know that Skyhawk was the perfect Indian name for my dad. Another lesson I learned from my dad is be persistent. My dad, we always teased him that he had what we called the dialing finger, which meant that he was more than happy to call and call again and wait on hold to see that something important got addressed. This quality was particularly helpful recently when mom and dad were both hospitalized in separate rooms and on the same floor. 
Despite the very strict visiting restrictions, Dad decided right away he was going to find a way to visit his wife. Knowing that once she was released from the hospital, there would be no visiting when Mom went to the rehab center. So Dad proceeded to ask every nurse, every doctor, and every aide, every time they came into his room, if they could do something to help him visit his wife. Finally, a very nice doctor at the hospital said, Pete, I don't make the rules, and this might break a rule, but I'm going to see what I can do to get you to see your wife. Dad was able to have three visits with Mom in the hospital before he and she got released. They were able to spend some time together and hold hands. Little did anyone know this would be the last time that they would visit with one another. And finally, I learned from Dad excuse me, that humor is always the right call. Dad's beloved dry sense of humor always had people guessing if he was serious or if he was kidding. His observations were hysterical, but you had to listen closely because they were often very, very subtle. I remember one time in the hospital, after one of Dad's huge aortic aneurysm surgeries, he was in the ICU, and a very, very serious young doctor was talking to Dad about how to get back on his feet, and she was going over you know, tips for nutrition and taking his medications on time. And he looked right at her and he said, well, what about jogging? <laughs> and she was like, um, uh, sir, um, well, we, we wouldn't necessarily recommend jogging for you yet. And he just left her stammering. I was in the room, silently doubled over in laughter, knowing that he was just kidding. This is classic Pete. The guy was never, not for one minute, planning on jogging. He just wanted to get a rise out of her. <laughs> Dad, we thank you for your love. We thank you for everything you taught us. And we love and miss you very much. <laughs> These words are written by uh, Heather, my wife, Peter's youngest, and I think officially favorite daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I will remember my dad for his kindness and generosity, his dry and hilarious sense of humor. I'll remember the special gifts at Christmas, the red hard chocolate boxes at Valentine's Day for all his girls. My dad became Irish on St. Patrick's Day and always wore green with mom. Dad gave generously of everything he had. When he won money at his lots or doing scratch offs, he gave it all to family and towards the end to the caregivers. He never kept any money for himself. When I was six, I broke my arm roller skating. My dad scooped me up in his arms, held me all the way to the hospital. He taught me how to drive and coached my softball team. He was an expert ski ball player and movie night popcorn maker, and he was my hero. My dad was strong but gentle generous and kind. He regularly whistled around the house and sang Santa Claus is coming to town <laughs> during one of my recent December visits, taking care of my parents. He loved opera, especially the three tenors and Andrea Pacelli. All three daughters had her own special connection with dad, a quiet and silent understanding between us of the love and common bond we shared. My memories of dad will live on forever in my heart. I know my dad is up in heaven, feeding the birds and sitting down for a great game of sheep's head with worthy opponents that have gone before him.
Please stand as our liturgical ministers enter our sacred space and join in singing how great thou art. <laughs> Retired priest of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, and grateful to be invited to assist here at uh, our Good Shepherd Parish. First of all, a couple personal touches. His date of death, February 13th. My dad died on February 13th, but a number of years ago. And uh, Peter went to Boys Tech. My brother George attended Boys Tech. And uh, he would have just turned 84 on February 22nd. He died December 31st. But it's entirely possible they bump shoulders at Boys Tech. So I feel like I'm connected to your family, too. Um, thank you for being here today, both in person and those who are watching this uh, celebration of the life of our friend Peter. And I'm Deacon Sandy, and something the family probably doesn't know is that I was your father's favorite deacon. <laughs> <laughs> when we have mass or Christian funeral, we very intentionally place the casket here. By the font, though it's empty because of COVID, it's still a profound symbol at the entrance of our worship space, reminding us of our baptism. We want to be reminded today of Peter's baptism, and here's why. We so often hear that upon mortal death, we then enter eternal life. No. We believe that in the waters of baptism, we enter symbolically to die to self, to rise to new life in Christ. So symbolically, Peter, on the day of his baptism, rose to life in Christ, which he lived so magnificently for so many years. And now that life in Christ is not ended, it's but changed. Listen to the introduction to the Eucharist of prayer. The Father will say words something like, in death, life is not ended, it has but changed. So we remember that rich symbol. And with this holy water, we bless these remains. 
We also have the baptism symbol of the candle at Peter's baptism and ours, probably. The godparents or parents would have been given a candle lit from the Easter candle, which that is. And they will be told that on behalf of the infant, that they should keep the light burning brightly. Peter kept the light burning brightly. He was a light in his life. The third rich symbol that we want to recall at the beginning of this Mass is the white garment that would have been put on Peter and us, signifying the dignity of the Christian life. So Judy, our acolyte now, is going to place that on the pole, and we're going to invite, I believe it is three of the grandchildren, Amanda, Lauren, and Nathan, to open this it's magic, if they simply keep opening it, it's going to be right in the right spot. But think of them when they're opening it as Christ putting his arms around Peter at this very moment. Thank you, and well done. Let us pray. O oh God, Almighty Father, our faith professes that your Son died and rose again. Mercifully grant that through this mystery, your servant Peter, who has fallen asleep in Christ, may rejoice to rise again through him who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We ask now that Susan come forward and proclaim from the Old Testament.
Please remain seated as Lauren comes forward and proclaims from the New Testament. St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Sisters and brothers, are you unaware that we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were indeed buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the, from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. If then we have died with Christ. We believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has power over him. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Rejoice, be glad, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they prosecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ.
Before the homily, I wanted to come to the family, standing here at the moment. I know his sister is there with her immediate family. And I wanted to say thank you. I wanted to say thank you because what you are doing by being here and helping plan this service is a corporal work of mercy. There are six that are well known. We have a graphic there on our south wall. Those are the ones that in Matthew 25 are most known. But Holy Mother Church in her wisdom has added a seventh corporal work of mercy, and this is it. To bury the dead with dignity and respect. So I say thank you for doing this holy and this profound thing. I also want to mention before I forget that we have in our church, in our worship space, a memorial board. You'll notice on the third line, the third name in, is Peter's. And the reason that we want you to know that is that at every Mass, on every weekend, we will recall Peter's name and pray for him and the others who have deceased this year until All Souls Day. And we often pray, at least once every week, for all the deceased in the parish. So your husband, and your father, and your grandfather, and your friend, and your brother, are it's going to be remembered for a long time in this space. Now you get the homily. <laughs> I mentioned to Pete's daughters how impressed I was by the obituary. It was one of the richest that I have seen. And between that obituary and now with these wonderful eulogies, we get a good sense of this special man. In eulogy, we typically hear mostly about the special nature of the deceased with their life lived on earth. Susan, you did a beautiful job. In fact, I don't really need to give a homily because of the eulogy you gave. You did such a good job of this. A homily in the Mass should focus on the richness and profound nature of the deceased life in Christ. So we're going to do that. And we want you who gather to be hope-filled because when we find in the deceased somebody who has lived a life filled with Christ-like characteristics, that gives us, what you'll hear in the final commendation, sure and certain hope that somebody like Pete, and specifically this Pete, and I think this one too, <laughs> will in fact find eternal life. Let me break that open a bit with you. When we think of what's happening for Pete, we should smile as he is. Can't you see him right now smiling at this moment? We heard in that first reading this beautiful description of what was on the mountain, and the mountain is the reference to heaven. We heard about a place filled with juice, richy, rich food, and pure choice wines a place where death has no power, a place where God will wipe away all tears, full of hope. Here are some specifics about what I learned about Pete and his life. I thought the choice of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 was so appropriate because Pete is all over the Beatitudes and the Beatitudes are all over Pete. Let me give you some examples. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's a phrase that isn't too common for us in Western culture. What does that mean? It doesn't mean blessed are the poor, that we do believe the poor are blessed in a special way. But the poor in spirit basically means those who, like the poor, are hungering for something. In the case of the poor food, 
Poor in spirit is reference to those who are hungering for God. Pete, his whole life, hungered for God, the good Lord. In his life, he was a faithful Christian, a faithful Catholic. He made sure his children went to Catholic school. He prayed each day over meals and at other times, every day. When he was not able to go to Mass, he would participate with TV Mass. And in some instance, just to be safe, he would record Masses so that if he couldn't get the Mass of the day, he could go to his archive and inventory. That's how much he loved Mass. He loved Scripture. He loved music. He would receive Eucharist regularly. We do believe that what comes from this table is the source and summit of our faith. He knew that. He believed that. I asked at the end of the time I met with the family for some summary statements, and I got several. One of them, one of the daughters said, I can summarize his life in one word. Faithful. Expanded a bit. He was faith-filled. Well, <coughs> The Beatitudes said, blessed are the meek. This was a meek man. He was humble, I heard. His daughters described him as a gentle giant. Giant not in stature, but giant in terms of personal integrity. He made every family gathering, but was careful never to call attention to himself. He was uncomfortable being the center of attention. His daughters also described him as the man in the back room. He was there, listening, participating in many ways, but he didn't want to draw attention to himself. He wanted, as I heard in the eulogy, he wanted all the attention to be on you. And each one of the you that he spoke with felt you were the only one that he was giving his attention to. We heard, blessed are the merciful. I heard some beautiful things about Pete that really break this beatitude open. He was a father figure to his two younger siblings, Susan and Gary, as their father died when they were quite young. And we heard in eulogy how he went out of his way to bring them back to Wisconsin so that the family could be together. Pete was merciful in those ways, but also because he got God's creation and he was merciful to every creature, human and non-human, that God created. We heard about the statue of St. Francis and the training of the squirrels, where he would put peanuts under St. Francis's nose and they were trained to come. He had a Franciscan spirituality about him. Be sure and check the, the back of the prayer cards if you pick one up. I understand that they have St. Francis with a squirrel and a bunny and a bird. What a great memory of Pete. And he had a special love, he and Dolores did, for Abby, a dog they had for some 20 years. A beautiful memory I heard, it reminded me of my father who taught me this. If there was some insect in the house, let's say a spider, rather than harming the spider, he would, as the family said, gently usher the spider outside. Isn't that beautiful? That's St. Francis. That's how special he was. In the Beatitudes, we hear blessed are the pure in heart. What does pure in heart mean? He was pure in heart. He was kind, generous, gentle, pure. He would go to every family event. He enjoyed spending time with his wife and his girls, my three daughters. He attended the plays, the musicals, sporting events, and coached girls softball. He would care for sick family members, and it confirmed his Franciscan spirituality and his servant mentality, wanting to serve others, and his pure heart. 
We also heard, blessed are the peacemakers. And as evidenced by his service to our country and the army, which we will honor at the end of Mass with military honors, he understood that. Towards the end of this Matthew Gospel of the Beatitudes, we hear two statements. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Now consider salt of the earth. We typically say somebody about somebody, you're the salt of the earth, meaning they were earthy. And so things like sense of humor, which he had, dry, and maybe not always understood by folks. I heard this, which I thought was a great example. Being surrounded by four women all of his life, his wife and three daughters, I heard him develop a keen sense of humor because he had to. <laughs> but think about this when it comes to salt. What does salt do? When you sprinkle salt on something, it brings out the best of what we sprinkle the salt on. Food, an ear of corn, a steak. It changes what it comes in contact with. The testimony of these eulogies are such that he changed you. He changed everybody he worked with. And my, one of my favorites is an ear of corn dipped in butter and sprinkled with salt. If you watch, the salt changes. Pete was changed by you. I'm sure at this moment he's smiling because he's so proud of you. And yes, one more time, he's saying, I love you through this service and these prayers. We also heard, you're the light of the world. We talked about the baptism candle. Father Peter mentioned at the beginning that Peter's memories live on. His light is still shining. And it's going to shine for the rest of your lives and the rest of the grandchildren's lives and their children's lives. Such was the nature of this man. One more beatitude I didn't mention, and it's about you. St. Luke mentions in one of his Gospels, let the dead bury the dead. St. Luke wasn't trying to be a wise owl. What he was saying is that people like Pete have run the good race. They fought the good fight. They're now being poured out like a libation, as Paul tells us. So really, when we gather, this isn't about Pete. It's about us. It's about us who are gathered here. And the Beatitudes address that. The Beatitudes say, blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. Now, after each of the eight Beatitudes statements, there is some reckoning of reference to heaven. Yours is the kingdom of God. Rejoice and be glad. You will see the face of God. That's our hope. That's what's happening for peace, Pete, right now. He is seeing the face of God. So, peace in heaven. I'm not trying to imagine that. Pete's in heaven right now. He's running around with duct tape and super glue, <laughs> helping the angels and saints with any chores that they might have. He's teaching his new friends there about this thing in Wisconsin we call the Friday fish fry. <laughs> He's become heaven's master plumber. Whenever they need something taken care of, plumbing or not, as we heard, he could fix anything. He's got a few scratch-offs and a few <laughs> lottery tickets. <laughs> and he's teaching the angels and saints about this thing that people don't understand, a dry sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> so God bless and protect you and keep you, dear Pete. Let our Memories of his light and his saltiness live on for years to come. And going back to mourning, enter into it completely. Christ died and cried at the death of his friend Lazarus. It's okay to cry. It's okay to get emotional when you give a eulogy. It's okay. It means you loved him. But if you enter into grief fully, the sooner you're going to emerge to recognize the light more fully that he lived. But most importantly, you're going to emerge out of grief to recognize the light of Christ shining in your life, giving you the same hope that Pete had in his heart and his life.
Amen? Amen. Confident in all that God does for us and will continue to do for us in our time of healing and concern for others, we bring to God our hope for prayer. And so we ask now that Keith and Tom come forward and proclaim the prayers of the faith. We have placed our prayer, <clears throat> our prayer before you. We know that you hear us in all our needs. Help us to be attentive to your word and put it into action in our world today through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
gifts that were going to be consecrated to the body and blood of Christ are holy. And later at the end of Mass, we will consecrate Pete's remains, which are holy as well. The symbol is, of course, our prayers rising to God. Pray, friends, that our gifts, bread, wine, and all that we offer will be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. May the, the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of God's name, for our good and good of all God's holy church. O oh Lord God, as we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings for the salvation of your servant Peter, we ask your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving savior may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord God, through your Son, Jesus. In him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful people, Lord God, life is changed, but not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for us in heaven. So with angels and saints, thrones, dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. You give life to all things. You make them holy. You never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. So, Lord God, we humbly ask you, by the same Spirit, to make holy these gifts that we have brought to you for consecration, that they become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. From the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, giving thanks, he broke the bread, handed it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when the supper was ended, he took the cup, giving thanks, saying the blessing, handing it to his disciples, said, Take this, all of you, drink from it. But this is the cup of my blood, blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. In our song, we proclaim this mystery of faith. 
and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon this offering of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may attain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Joseph, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. O oh Lord God, may the sacrifice of our reconciliation advance the peace and salvation of all the world and be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant francis our pope our bishops jerome james jeffrey richard and Robert, with the order of bishops clergy deacons religious and the entire people you have gained for your own oh lord god listen to the prayers of the family gathered here before you in your compassion gather to yourself all your people scattered throughout the world. Lord God, remember your servant Peter, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. And from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body after the pattern of his own glorious body to our departed brothers and sisters too, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages, and praise you without end, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. coming of the kingdom as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And deliver us, Lord God, from all that is evil, Grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we will be always free from sin, safe from worry and fear, as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace. My peace I give you. Look not on our sins. Look on the faith of your church. Grant us all the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let's offer each other now a sign of Christ's peace.
This is the Lamb of God, Jesus the Lord, our Savior. Happy are we who come to this table. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Only say the word, and my soul shall be. Since we are so few, let's make the distribution of the body as simple as possible. I will come to you right where you are, offering the body of Christ. We will not distribute the blood of Christ for COVID reasons, but know that if you, re you receive in one form or the other, you fully receive the body of Christ. Thank you for cooperating. sisters reposing the Blessed Sacrament on behalf of Father Peter and I and Sister Joanne and our acolyte and our musician and our cantor and the parish. We want to acknowledge all those who are participating via the live stream. It's good to have you with us either in the moment or perhaps watching this later <laughs> as Pete would have. I can see him with his DVR out now recording this. So we want you to know that you are welcome. And please come and see us here sometime. You would be welcome in this space.
Let us pray. O Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey, mercifully grant that, strengthened by it, our brother Peter may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Trusting in God, we have prayed together for our brother Peter. And now we come to a last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall meet again and enjoy each other's friendship. Although this congregation will disperse in sorrow, the mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus Christ. certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ he will rise with him on the last day we give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon Peter in this life they are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the Saints in Jesus merciful God turn toward us and listen to our prayers open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us to remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet again and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our funeral director, Steve, is now going to come forward and make an announcement on behalf of the family. As we now leave out uh, to go into the vestibule for after the Mass, we're going to have military honors. So all of you just follow the casket on out, and out there the military will take over with military honors. Let us accompany him now to his final resting. 